directorate at the Air Force Research Lab. I didn't know, I knew that his PhD was from Cornell, but I found out that all his degrees, bachelor's, master's, and PhD are from the material science and engineering department at Cornell University. He has more than 250 articles on nanomaterials. And um, there he has several awards, including the Air Force McLucas Award for basic research, ACS Blue Little Award, Air Force Outstanding Scientist. He's a fellow of several societies. Today, uh, he is going to have a talk on 2D nanocrystal assemblies. So with that, uh, you can go ahead, Rich. Thanks a lot for being here today. You're muted though. We still cannot hear you. There we go. Yep. Thank Thanks. you very much, uh, both for the technical help as well as the kind invitation to participate uh, participate in the in the meeting. I was definitely looking forward to coming back to campus, um, but I guess we'll we'll we'll, we'll do that at another time. Um, I also uh, really excited to be part of a QCMR activity. It was a big part of my graduate studies, um, the community that it creates at Cornell uh, around materials is, is unique and it, uh, it's a really benefit for those who are studying there. So it's a real pleasure to come back and talk at, uh, share with you guys some of the work that's going on at the airport um, through this forum. So what I'd like to do, is, as I mentioned, is summarize some work uh, currently ongoing here in my group uh, at AFRL, uh, really to look at maturation of material technologies to focus on the transition of lab-based functional nanoparticles to uh, an engineering platform that component designers can use. So specifically, I'll give you the status of a recent line of effort focused on 2D nanocrystals um, using layered transition metal dicotelgenides as a, as a case study. Um, and give you an idea of where we're at today and, and what that is leading to or putting in place for what we're doing over the next few years. Uh, but the, the highlight is really what I want to get across is that connection between deeper mechanistic understanding of materials chemistry and the foundational role it plays in ensuring reproducible and payable supply, which is um, so critical to develop an innovation platform. Uh, but before I begin, I really want to thank this outstanding group of, of incredible folks uh, on my team here uh, at AFRL. I uh, really I'm just have the privilege to share with you uh, their efforts and their work. Um, most importantly, though, I want to highlight Ali Jawab, uh, first author here. Um, he is an incredible, insightful material chemist, and a lot of the work I'll talk about um, is, is work uh, that he's done. Uh, along the lines. Okay, I'm trying to get it to move forward. Um, so as the uh, Air Force and the Space Force pivots towards uh, peer competitors, um, new capabilities are driving new platform requirements. And one of the key tenants um, moving forward uh, is this concept of mass or the number of systems. Uh, and that just simple concept of having um, an order of magnitude or more systems is placing new demands on components. Not only that the components have to deliver uh, extreme performance, but uh, it really places a premium on low cost, facile manufacturing, the ability to expand platform technologies to address many different forms um, and to be able to deliver um, size, weight, and, and power needs. Uh, optical components and coatings are, are one of the areas where nanoparticles um, really uh, have a real opportunity to make a difference. Um, their extreme light matter interactions, whether it's plasmonic or low dimensional nanocrystals, um, really provide a order of magnitude change in, in some of the overall component characteristics. 
uh, just as a simple example in the bottom right hand corner, if you just think of your sunglasses, uh, the optical density of your sunglasses is about 0.2. Um, normal dyes, um, you need um, about 20 microns of a film at six volume per cent to give you that. Um, but many of the inorganic nanoparticles, um, six and a half weight percent, 20 nanometers can give you um, almost what you would see in just a, a normal um, pair of sunglasses. But the key challenge is, is not just one-off demonstrations of a few nanoparticles for a few optical components. What is truly needed to address some of the future requirements is to take these, this potential of, of solution lab nanoparticles and create technology platforms or environments that, um, that allow one to build processes and systems from in a modular way. So there's a couple of key components, uh, almost like Lego blocks that we're all familiar with, is that you must have reproducible component supply you have to have reproducible interfacial design um, and the ability to democratize the processes and the system building or the rules and the understanding for how all these things can come together. If you can develop uh, these three, uh, three key characteristics similar to software community, um, you can create a platform where engineers can then innovate, choose, develop analysis of alternatives to then deliver new products uh, for different types of applications. So what I'll uh, talk about today, as I mentioned before, is the work we've been doing on layer transition metal dichalginides. And the reason why highlighting this is it's an example of a, I think, of an emerging class of low, uh, low dimensional nanocrystals. Um, we're all familiar with single wall nanotubes, boron nitride, um, uh, graphene, where a uh, single composition uh, provides incredible properties. Um, but a new set of, of, of compositions, materials such as PMDs, maxines, et cetera, are isostructural. Um, and depending on the composition in that structure, there's a large range of properties. So for example, for TMDs, um, of the 40 odd possible uh, compositions that are two-dimensional, um, you can find everything from semiconductors to semi-metal, superconductor, topological insulator, um, metallic, magnetic. So from an optical point of view, everything that interacts with electromagnetic radiation from the visible clear to VRF. Uh, and so the challenge that we would like to do is how to generate a platform technology when I can, where I could take powders of any of these, uh, put them in solution and develop processing um, so that uh, an engineer can sit down and design electronic, a sensor or optical coatings without having to go clear back to understanding specific chemistries for specific nanoparticles for specific compositions uh, way back to the source material. And in TMDs, as similar to, to other nanoparticle systems, it really boils down to two challenges that the community has been facing uh, for um, many years. Uh, with many incredible point solutions, but really not uh, developing the reproducibility, the verification, the validation such that um, it becomes turnkey for an industrial process or an engineer to use. And, and these boil down pretty much to availability and scale up, you know, the time, the energy, the reactants that are used, are they cost effective? Can you get it into the correct solvents and formulate the processability? Can you control purity like we've heard before with a lot of the bio discussions uh, early on this morning? And equally so, the interfacial modifications. It's one thing to have the particles available, but if you can't stick them together, modify their properties, put the right things on the surface for the right application, uh, control the defects, um, you really haven't uh, created a, a coherent um, technology. So for a little bit of background with regard to, to the TMDs where things stood, so moly disulfide is, is one of the major materials that people have looked at and are looking at, one of the 40. Uh, there's a few tungsten variants that folks look at. Um, the moly tungsten sulfur selenium series are usually the four that most people look at. Um, but from a solution point of view, a lot of the initial work in this area was based on extensive intercalation work of these materials in the 60s 
um, you know, a lot of work uh, leading to lithium batteries today where uh, a lot of the foundations were done back in the 60s. And Credit in 81 um, established this approach where you take butyl lithium, uh, mix it with molydisulfide. The lithium donates an electron through the molydisulfide, um, causes an uh, in-plane crystallographic change um, that effectively charges the sheet up and the sheet is then easily dispersed uh, in water and then you can process things and convert in a reduction fashion back to the semiconducting form of molydisulfide. A um, lot of problems with that as those who have ever tried to do this process with graphene to graphene oxide, um, you end up with uh, inducing a lot of defects, polycrystalline, et cetera. And, and from a platform technology, this really only works for molydisulfide. The community got very excited um, and a lot of the resurgence happened in the 2000s, uh, some work out of Trinity from Coleman's group where he looked at this problem in a slightly different way and said, well, maybe since they're Van der Waals solids, if we just match the surface energies and I add mechanical force, maybe I can uh, shear the systems apart and reduce the enthalpic penalty uh, by matching interfacial energy. And um, he created a very nice system where he demonstrated that a few solvents for a few of the TMDs um, with high sonication or high mechanical energies actually would exfoliate a uh, single layer or a few layer material. Some of the problems, however, again, it wasn't um, broad across all the material systems uh, and the solvents that were used, um, surfactants with water or, or um, NMP were very poor for, poor for processability, which you can see on the top pictures. Um, and a lot of the TMDs are hydrolytically unstable, and so working in water and stuff lead to degradation of the system. So one of the really nice things that uh, Ollie uh, hit upon a few years back was a recognition that um, NMP, when it has a little bit of water in it, if heated, forms hydroperoxide. And so the solvent in a lot of the processing that Coleman and, and others after him were using was not necessarily an inert solvent. And what he showed was if you can uh, purposely generate these hydroperoxides by just adding small millimolar amounts of water to anhydrous NMP, you can actually drive exfoliation of molydisulfide without any of the uh, shear necessary. So fully uh, a chemical process as shown here in the bottom, uh, bottom corner. And over the last few years, we've really worked hard on establishing what is the mechanism that is underlying that. And that's sort of summarized uh, on this page. So moly disulfide um, has oxidation products. If it's powder stored in ambient, et cetera, they form on the surface. And so removing those is critical. And when you do, you can actually generate a stoichiometric process. So after you clean the system off, um, you can actually form these oxidative products um, without having to use the in situ uh, hydroperoxide generation from NMP. You can use other types of oxidants, such as chemium hydroperoxide, and you can establish where um, the equilibrium is between these metal oxide um, clusters that are formed from oxidation of the TMDs uh, and the TMD itself. So you know exactly stoichiometrically the amount of oxidant to put in. And these metal oxide precursors are, are actually well known to form polyoxymetallate through a condensation process driven by a reduction. Um, and these small metal oxide precursors are highly charged. They can have charges upwards of 10 to 20. Um, and you can uh, convert these precursors to these polyoxymetallates stoichiometrically by just adding a little bit of reducing agent, especially if you've consumed all the oxidant to generate these. And what's very interesting is that the presence of these polyoxymetallates are directly related to the amount of EMD uh, that is dispersed. So what does all this mean? What this means is that I can take any powder then, I can generate these um, inorganic precursors in solution, convert them to an inorganic surfactant, these palms, um, exfoliate. Um, and I know what's limiting that degree of exfoliation, which is the amount of these metal oxide, uh, oxide precursors I start with. 
so I can recover powders that haven't been exfoliated and recycle the process again. And this is a, a example of, of two back-to-back -back processes, just recovering the powder and redoing it again and demonstrating the reproducibility of being able to exfoliate these things time and time again. So yields now are not 1%, but almost 100% if you do the cycle process based on the chemistry. What also is you can make it living. So instead of recycling the powder out, I can controllably inject the reducing agent, start and stop the exfoliation process, monitor the depletion of the precursors, add more precursors to it, and re-kick the process off again. And so this mechanism actually spans over three orders of magnitude for the molybdite cell So this is all well and good, but we're still stuck with one particular composition. But as I mentioned before, the TMDs are isostructural, and so there's a assumption that some of the fundamental materials chemistries are going to be consistent across the board, and that is the case. And so um, what you see here is using the same mechanism of generating these precursors, forming um, these polyoxymetylates in solution and allowing them to absorb and drive exfoliation works for at least all the commercially available TMDs uh, we've been able to get our hands on. Also because of the, uh, the large charge that these have, um, they're highly stable uh, in contrast to the surfactant processes. You can have them stable. We have been stable for many years. Because I can do this in non-water solvents, I can make anhydrous systems. I can uh, avoid the degradation. I can a variety of other solvents are available, again, because these chemistries are amenable to um, uh, polar aprotic solvents. Uh, and probably most importantly is you can generate bulk solutions at high enough concentration that you can actually see a single layer optoelectronic performance such as fluorescence uh, from these solutions, which normally are only seen for a high-end vapor deposited film. So just one last thing on this. Everything I described though doesn't necessarily imply that the precursor has to come from the material I wish to exfoliate. And so this actually demonstrates the ability to create these metal oxide precursors, extract the TMD powder from, and then these use these precursors to exfoliate other TMDs. So over here is an example of what we call heteropalms. So using precursors generated from uh, molybdenum disulfide to exfoliate titanium sulfide, molybdenum diselenide, and a variety of other things. Why this is critical is that these palms, of course, can dope. Uh, there's a charge interchange with the semiconductor TMD. And by controlling the palms that are on the surface, they each have different work functions. You can start selecting uh, different palms to be N or P dopants for different semiconductors in solution. So now we're starting to develop a technology and a platform where we can mix and match not only the exfoliation chemistry, but the optoelectronics uh, and the dopant characteristics of the materials that we're using to explore all in one systematic mechanism that spans across uh, all the layers of TMD. So that's good, um, but we still have we still have a few things to move forward with. And one of those is the interface. Um, I can control the inorganic properties, I can control production, I can scale these up, but now the next question is that interfacial control. How do we modify the surface so we can uh, put things on them, take things off, integrate them into different platform technologies? As we do? So what is very nice about, again, the process I just described is the ability to put the TMDs in a variety of different solvents. And anybody who have done organic chemistry before knows that that's the key to driving different organic reactions is to be able to place things in different solvents. And so let me just summarize some work we've done in the last year or so towards this idea of covalent functionalization uh, of these platform uh, TMDs. So we'll start with group five. Uh, these are the molydisulfides, the tungsten selenides, um, et cetera. On the left-hand side is the general uh, orbital band structure. Uh, from these, uh, thanks to Frank DeSalvo's uh, graduate inorganic chem course, came back to be used again a few years later. 
Uh, but anyway, here is the uh, band structure for uh, the general band structure for the group six EMDs. They're semiconductive, so they have a full uh, a full band uh, right below the Fermi level. Um, but if one thinks of using a strong nucleophile, you can inject electrons into the band right above the Fermi level, and this band is dominated by the d orbital of the transition metal. And so, as I mentioned before early on, this process was used for exfoliation. Butyl lithium, for example, is a, a great example of this type of strong nucleophile. But it is so strong and the injections are so much that it fully fills this band and causes a crystallographic change. So if we pull back the strength of the nucleophile, for, for example, using Grignards or A amides, we are able to now demonstrate surface functionalization while retaining the crystallographic structure of the semiconductor phase. So tuning the ability of the injection of the electron to the uh, D orbital. And so here's an example of doing that both with Grignards and A amides with short aliphatic chain, um, just demonstrating that we can put these uh, aliphatics, short aliphatics between the layers. What that implies though, from a property point of view is now you can convert what are highly charged systems from the palms to neutral systems, convert those then to be soluble in things like chloroform, um, and because we are injecting above the Fermi level and we're controlling the um, degree of charge injection, um, we're able to do this and retain the semiconducting property, which is the key characteristic for this group. So if we move to group five, we can do similar types of, of concepts and platform technologies to the, the group five, because I've moved over one um, column in the transition that will actually have an unpaired electrons at the Fermi level, and this is why they're semiconductor. So in, in contrast to a strong nucleophile, if we use a weak nucleophile, such as amine or phosphine, we're able to pair up the electrons at the Fermi level. And you can confirm that by um, EPR. Um, and the solvent is a critical role. You need to move to um, more non-reactive solvents than NMP to actually uh, execute these types of, of reactions. But again, similar what I showed for the group five, you're able to um, put small organics between these layers, disperse them in aprotic solvents. But in this case, because I have an unpaired um, pair of electrons at the Fermi level and I'm working with charge injection there, um, as you do the functionalization, not only do you take the dispersion from acetonitrile, for example, to DCM because of the uh, organic nature of what I'm putting on the surface, you also fundamentally transition the semiconductor, or the semi-metal characteristics of the group five to a semiconductor as to be, as to be seen by the advancement of the color. This is really exciting because now you can actually compositionally tune and go back and forth between these characteristics just by how you functionalize this. So if we bring all this together, just to kind of conclude here, we've talked about the ability to create all different types of PMDs, dispersions, how to functionalize them and control them. That then leads ultimately to processability. And so by doing all this, you can control the solution composition and rheology to generate very nice uniform films using simple Dr. Blade processing from um, all of these dispersions. You can, of course, if I'm putting plates down using the Dr. Blade process, I can get very high alignment orientation parameters of uh, upwards of 20% of, of, of perfect order in contrast to if I just try to put the powders down. Um, and these then can be floated off, put on soft substrates, um, et cetera, or even made into nanocomposites of different once you make the films though, and you have this ability to do the doping characteristic, you can then combine it all to tune the optical properties. And that's what I'd like to leave you with is some of the recent work we've done this spring along those lines. Um, on the left-hand side is the absorbance of this systems in, in solution. Um, and using different types of dopant chemistries, um, spun off of the polyoxymetylates halide base, which is a, 
under patent um, review right now, and so unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to share the details. But it's inspired by the palm process. Um, you're able to very distinctly control the strength of the exciton by uh, controlling how strong the, the surfactant or this inorganic process is in doping. Because we've converted from the polyoxide mentholate to halide, they're much easier to remove. And so I can generate films, use the precursors to control the processing, and then remove them. And what that implies is that if I'm looking at spectroscopic oxometry in the visible, uh, clear out the variety of IR windows, I can move what is normally a refractive index of a highly doped molydisulfide film um, towards what you get from um, um, MOCVD, MOS2. The blue here is a is a vapor phase transport synthesis powder we've done uh, in house to grow the crystal size, very large. Use the chemistries that I've talked about to be able to create solution films um, that are starting to rival the optical properties, linear optical properties in the IR uh, that you would get from MOCVD. And in this case, all done in a manner with which you can uh, do roll to roll processing with optical coefficients of four and beyond. It's very exciting for optics. So hopefully what I've been able to do is give you an idea of this idea of a platform technology um, and in, in creating and solving some of the supply reproducibility problems. And then by doing that, enabling the modularity. Where we're going next with those, both in, in stuff that uh, some of you may be familiar with that our team has done in the past on gold, where anorods, similar for the CMDs now, is a heavy focus on the functionalization of polymers on the surface. Um, one of the key things of the creating these polymer nanoparticle hybrid systems is that in contrast to adding the nanoparticle to a matrix, if I attach the matrix to the nanoparticle, I can create single component systems in a modular fashion that I can tune properties. So for example, physical form, these are single component nanoparticles with polymers on their surface, everywhere from liquids clear to solid powders. You can tune the processing with the polymers on the surface everywhere from Landau-Levitch to evaporative regimes with polymeric type characteristics that are producible and well understood in roll to roll processing um, and even control tenacity and toughness. These are examples of spherical systems with polystyrene grafted on them. But if you do it correctly, that the polymers entangle, making almost superstar like materials, you get very novel failure, toughness, crazing behaviors that lead to uh, improvements in tenacity and toughness. And so bringing both the supply together, the chemistries together, and now working on the modularity of the interface, um, we're really hoping to pull these together and, and demonstrate to the engineers that we have tunable platform technologies that they can start addressing their needs in a variety of optical things. So I wanna thank you guys very much for your attention um, and very much uh, would be happy to answer any questions on this work or uh, any interest uh, in the broader work that's done at AFRL. Uh, those who are interested in more details of what goes on here uh, in Dayton with our uh, about a thousand person workforce, um, you can Google some of that information on the bottom and I'll give you some insights and I'd be happy to follow up on anything uh, if you have any questions. So again, thank you very much for your time. Um, sorry to go over a little bit. And if there's any time, I'd be happy to answer questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rich, for the excellent presentation. So uh, if, uh, again, I want to remind uh, the audience that you can raise your hand or post your question in the chat. So as an engineer, I'm, I'm more towards the, the End of your talk. So I have, I have a. If there's no other question from the from the audience, I have a question. Uh, towards the end, that you, you talked about toughness, but you also talked about uh, functional behavior of these and the of, in, in these film structures. And are are we mainly talking about op optical properties, or what what type of functionalization are we 
aiming towards with these yeah. specific materials? So that's a great question. I, I skipped that critical slide uh, in the talk. I flipped over it. So um, the TMDs uh, have properties everywhere from semiconducting to semi-metallic to superconducting, uh, et cetera. And so the, diff the opportunities for different devices and coatings are broad. So we have collaborations using these for gas sensors, for biosensors, um, for printed transistors, for photovoltaics, um, and tough optical coatings. Um, those are just a few of the things we are currently doing um, uh, with our collaborators. But uh, if you look into the literature on all the, all the possibilities that folks have just explored with molydisulfide, um, there's, there's a, a large range of engineering opportunities um, there. Many of them are inhibited by not having the commercial supply um, to integrate them into inks or solution processing or, or, or manufacturing technologies that are uh, prevalent today uh, in those technology areas. Okay, and I think you also answered my second question, which would be, are these functionalized uh, properties any times coupled with toughness, and I think you answered that with the tough optical uh, uh, sensors or coatings that, mm -hmm. that you mentioned. Okay, thank you very much again for being here today. So uh, if we could uh, share Xuanhe Zhao's uh, slides, please.